गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल माई सेल्फ डॉक्टर अर्जुन फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हिस्ट्री एंड आर्कियोलॉजी सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कर्नाटक आई विल बी स्पीकिंग ऑन द प्री हिस्टोरिक स्टोन टूल्स आइडेंटिफाई रिकॉर्डिंग एंड एनालिसिस बिफोर आई बिगिन माई टॉक आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक the organizers for organizing a two day national webinar on techniques and methods in historical research by the department of history vastad art science college and bellihal commerce college honorable at bagalkot this talk is basic to understanding stone tool types and technology and we will also be focusing on how to identify stone tools how to record them and how to analyze the stone tools for a better understanding of psycho technological features of the prehistoric stone tools the past of human our the cultural history can be broadly divided or classified into two that is prehistory and history prehistory is the period of the beginning of the use of stone tools to write in script and this is a very very vast period which is a pre literate society which has witnessed two different contrasting climatic epochs that is pleistocene and holocene pleistocene represents ice age with glacial and interglacial periods holocene is relatively humid compared to the ice age and this is the period where melting of the ice and formation of many a uh, river catchment was activated and the holocene climate is more or less similar to the present condition that is the warmer phase now the prehistoric population have witnessed both the climatic conditions ice age as well as the holocene pleistocene represents larger period of the paleolithic culture whereas holocene largely represent particularly the early and middle holocene represents mesolithic culture neolithic culture chalcolithic culture and iron age culture it also includes the bronze age the age where the first civilization in the indian subcontinent of the northwestern part emerged flourished and expanded however in the definition of prehistory we are particularly speaking to the period of where there is no script and it is pre literate society in the case of harappa or indus valley civilization we do have evidence of script but there is a lack of reading and understanding of script so therefore that period of civilization or culture is proto historic in nature prehistory as i said is a very long period which has also witnessed a consistent range of human evolution alongside who authored the cultural development and cultural evolution so therefore right from the early hominins and other major uh, homo species such as neanderthals homo sapiens and anatomical modern humans all this a uh, predominant species contributed to the development of prehistoric culture and they all exit from africa and have moved around the old world at different episodes on different routes it could be coastal and inland 
So overall, the dispersal of hominins and early humans is subject to multiple episodes as well as with on the different routes where they reach us, Europe, Africa, Asia and other parts of island, island geographies in Southeast Asia. Now, prehistory is a wide range of cultural activities. It is not just that the prehistoric population expanded and occupied different geographical regions of the old world, particularly Africa and Eurasia, but when you look at the prehistoric culture, its nature, its features and cultural materials, it is also uh, very dynamic. However, by and large, prehistoric studies is much focused over the stone tools. It could be because of many reasons. One of the, prim one of the uh, primary reasons as how the prehistory is heavily dependent on stone tools is that the nature of the stone tools itself, it is highly non-perishable and it has coexisted with the geological as well as geomorphological context of the earth. So therefore, stone tools are a predominant sources for, the, for understanding the prehistoric culture, society, technology and possible uh, association of other social and subsistence activities. Next to the stone tools, uh, beads, particularly made up of bone and shell, are also one of the important materials. In addition to the stone tools, prehistoric cultures might have used the skeletal remains of animal in uh, fragmenting or in crafting, in crafting them into uh, implements or tools. Then rock art, the, the process of making images, the process of depicting what they saw or it can also be a method of communicating among themselves. So rock art, uh, making of images on the rock surface with the use of pigments, naturally available pigments are one of the uh, uh, one of the wide varieties of activities where we can find them across the uh, continent. Though this process is gradual, but it is becomes very clear by the time of Upper Paleolithic to recent. In in understanding the ritualistic approaches of the prehistoric culture, apart from rock art, burials have also played an important role to understand their belief system, their custom, and probably how they started to believe in the life after the death or the, the tradition where they adopted to respect the dead individuals of their members. And the burial, intentionally buried burials of human beings is uh, uh, come to the, come to it came to existence in India from the Mesolithic period. We all know that Neolithic period is the period of revolution, particularly for agriculture, polished better stone tools, and very importantly, the making of pottery. It started with the handmade pottery and gradually they developed wheels on potteries. So Neolithic period in Indian subcontinent adds to the understanding of agro-pastoral communities who have gradually turned from hunter-gatherers. However, hunter, hunting, hunting and gathering from the hunt also continued even during agro-pastoral communities coexisted. It could be with the Neolithic communities or within the Neolithic, Chalcolithic and other cultural periods as well. So prehistoric cultures clearly tell us a transition from nomadic foragers to becoming sedent kind of societies. 
So sedentism is where they started to uh, settle down at one place for certain period of time with a uh, with an objective to look into their agro-pastoral activities. So these are some of the uh, cultural activities or cultural features that we try to understand regarding the prehistoric culture. Beyond this, as archaeology becoming a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary subject matter, even in the spheres of prehistoric studies, Population expansion and site distribution are becoming one of the predominant studies to understand how they dispersed out of Africa, how the prehistoric population dispersed within or inland of the subcontinent, uh, wherever they are found now. Now, this is possible also by studying the sites through the stone tools, dating of stone tools, and very importantly, the makers of this stone tools. Therefore, the makers of the stone tools or the prehistoric uh, population is better understood through the paleontology and genetic studies. Paleo environment and paleo ecology is the study of past climate ecology which was contemporary to the prehistoric population and this help this has helped us to understand what was the impact of climate, what was the impact of ecology, what was the impact of changing forest condition in the different parts of the world corresponded to the development of prehistoric culture. Now, coming to be very precise to the Indian context or Indian prehistory, the prehistoric cultures of India can be classified into five periods that is Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Chalcolithic and Mesolithic culture. Now, the Paleolithic culture is further classified into three uh, sub-phases, Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic. The Paleolithic culture in India is dated back to 1.5 million years securely and it continued down up to 10,000 years ago until the Mesolithic transition occurred. So the Lower Paleolithic started from approximately 1.5 million years. Then the transition was occurring during the 400,000 years ago to 77,000 years ago. Then Upper Paleolithic from 40,000 to 12,000 years ago. Now the Mesolithic culture in Indian subcontinent is largely represented by the presence of microblades or microlithic technologies, which is spanning from 45,000 years ago to 3,200 before present. The Neolithic culture, which is geographically diverse and differs within the subcontinent, but it is widely found, uh, found widely found and emerged since 8,000 years and gradually transformed into the early historic or iron age by 1200 BCE. Parallel to Neolithic culture, Chalcolithic culture in the uh, certain parts of uh, Western Deccan, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, it started to flourish from 5500 to 1000 BCE. Then the last transition was occurring in the form of megalithic culture the culture which believed in the elaborate uh, disposal of the dead associated with the lithic appendages or certain monumental features during 1200 to 3300 before common era. Now, all these uh, prehistoric cultures in India and when you look at its chronology, there are certain uh, overlaps. Though the overall period of prehistory range from 1.5 million years ago to 1200 uh, BCE, but there is temporal dissimilarity in the cultural developments. For example, the Middle Paleolithic culture overlaps with the Upper Paleolithic culture, particularly when we look when we look at the stone tool types and technology. Microlithic technology overlaps, overlaps with Upper Paleolithic by itself dating back to 45,000 
years ago. Then Nagarits also overlap with the Neolithic culture, where there is certain uh, dissimilarity in the ritualistic formation, ritualistic uh, representation of the burials in the form of Nagarits can also be uh, found in the Neolithic level. So therefore, Indian subcontinent is a very vast area and this vast area is ecologically diverse, climatically diverse, the landscape differs and the adaptation of prehistoric culture to this wide varieties of landscape has also shown a regional variations. So that is why understanding the geographical diversity of the Indian subcontinent in the context of prehistoric site distribution plays a pivotal role. Now let us uh, look into a uh, little bit of details on the Paleolithic cultures in India. Though I will not be going in depth into the cultural understandings and site formations of the prehistoric sites, but in a general understanding, we have to uh, be clear that the Indian subcontinent and the Paleolithic cultures are uh, very much focused in these four zones that is, Greater and Lesser Himalayan region. Shivaliks, Indo-Gangetic Plains, and Peninsula, India. The most important excavated and dated sites of Lower Paleolithic in India are Asirampakkam, Izampur, Bhimbetra, Tikoda, Nagarjuna Konda, Rivas, etc. Important sites of Middle Paleolithic are Asirampakkam, Jwalapuram, Otaram, etc. Then Upper Paleolithic sites, the Upper Paleolithic culture in Indian subcontinent is very much uh, enigmatic which requires a lot of research to understand but to an extent we have some information coming from the Garo Hills of Assam, Bhimbetga, Inamgao, Pushkar Lake in Rajasthan and very significantly from the uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh. Now, if you look at the Mesolithic culture in India, Mesolithic culture is uh, post Pleistocene, that is, it corresponds to the early Holocene skeleton, but considering the Microlithic technology uh, appearance in the Middle Paleolithic levels through Upper Paleolithic level, it also shows us that the Mesolithic culture is wide and it is uh, evident from the late Pleistocene and as well as in the Holocene. So prob uh, possibly the Mesolithic culture in India might have witnessed the uh, both uh, both climatic conditions Pleistocene and Holocene. To a larger extent uh, in India, the Indian sites, Mesolithic culture is characterized by the appearance of microliths. Uh, it could be a sequential from symmetric to asymmetric microliths and others, other tools such as these crystals. Mesolithic culture in India, they started to disperse themselves into the different uh, ecological regions of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, possibly uh, it was an impact of climatic change as well as certain uh, development in the culture itself. They started to occupy their settlements or the occupation in the rock shelter, open air sites, and hilltop sites. So therefore, these three kind of uh, occupational features starts to be uh, understood very important for the landscape studies as well. Because when we when we look at the Mesolithic culture in the rock shelter context, they focus more into the uh, central and southern part of the Indian Peninsula. Now, open air sites are. Uh, uh, much more found in the Gangetic Plains. Hilltop sites are frequently found again in the uh, sub South Indian landscapes. And looking at the rock art, an elaborate depiction of uh, wild animals uh, is very much clear in the rock art images of Mesolithic period or the Mesolithic sites. Hunting and fishing of various animals is also represented through the uh, 
uh, an emergent site, the cloud from the site. Few sites in the Gujarat and Uttar Pradesh have also shown human burial evidences, and there are multiple uh, human uh, burials in different contexts. But it is very much clear that there was also an attempt made by the Mesolithic culture to dispose the dead along with the grave goods. From the plains of Gujarat and western central India, the number of sites, that is the density of sites are relatively higher. However, a proper study and explorations, particularly on the banks of uh, river Krishna, will substantiate a high density of sites of Mesolithic period or not at least the Mycolithic sites. This is very much clear in the Shorapur Dawog and the Raichur Dawog. The most important sites of the Mesolithic period are Ramganj, Adamgar, Birhanpur, Jalahalli, Jalahalli of Bangalore, Nagarjuna Konda of Andhra Pradesh, Patgal of Karnataka, Northern Karnataka, Kangankalu Kukgal in Baldari, Mehatakeri in Maharashtra, Hunski Baishpal Valley in today's Yadgir district. Now, as discussed, by the, uh, by the uh, emergence of Mesolithic culture, the wide distribution of sites across Indian subcontinent had already begun, and that was also the period where uh, their transformation from hunter-gatherer to the communities of uh, fishing are depending on the aquatic, aquatic species started to increase. This is this effect could be due to the climate change as well as the change in the landscape of the forest ecology. However, Mesolithic culture gave gradual transformation to sedentism and settled villages by the time of Neolithic and Chalcolithic cultures. The Neolithic and Chalcolithic cultures, though, though they are different in terms of certain cultural materials, for example, the ceramics, the settlement pattern, the landscape modification and the landscape adaptation as well as the concentration of clustered sites might be different. But to our understanding, what is very important is that both Neolithic and Chalcolithic culture represent early forming of animal and agriculture. So therefore, if you, if you look at the history of agriculture of human society or India, the earliest level of the earliest phase of agriculture as well as domestication of animals goes back to the Neolithic and Chalcolithic culture. It is it's a matter, it, is a, it, 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 it also has a uh, chronological differences where the earliest date for Neolithic culture goes back to 7000 to 7000 and 8000 BC, whereas Chalcolithic emerged 5000 to 5000 and 5500 BC. But they both coexisted down up to 1000 and 1200 BCE when you look at the southern India. The, the both Neolithic and Chalcolithic cultures in the Indian subcontinent can be broadly classified into uh, 13 traditions. They are geographically different, I mean they are geographically diverse with concentrated sites in different ecological regions. It could be Mehargar in the Balochistan area, Burgaham in Kashmir, Kaimur in UP Bihar, Dangar tradition in the Gangetic Plains of UP, Utkal tradition, Anartha, Mewar, Malwa, in the western Deccan and central uh, India. Deccan tradition is also part of it and it also includes the uh, northern part of uh, no, central and northern part of uh, Peninsula. Then Ashmont tradition. Ashmont tradition is where particularly the formation of ash mounds due to the intensive and extensive burning of cattle dung was a predominant uh, practice of the Neolithic culture of South India. Then we have Brahmaputra tradition, 
Torax sedation and OCP, occur colored pottery sedation. So neolithic and chalcolithic cultures in India are very very important to understand the early phase of agriculture as well as domestication of animals. This was also the time period where ground tools industry and blade and microclips tradition coexisted. Though Neolithic tradition brought in a better uh, effective and uh, polished axes for unknown, for unknown reasons, but though it is hafted for a particular purpose. This was also the time where uh, crypto crystalline silica kind of rocks were ex ex exploited for making of blades and microliths. Metamorphic rocks such as dolerite, diorite, granite were used for ground tool industry as well as for lawn edge tool industry, for example, uh, for the use of querns, mullers, etc. So, uh, ceramics is a wide uh, production of various categories and subtypes. In addition to that, chalcolithic culture is known for the, uh, the production of copper and use of copper tools and implements. They domesticated animals such as sheep, goat, dog. Very importantly, also the cattle, boss indicus. The chalcolithic cultures in the central India and western Deccan, they were very much into the uh, industry of uh, bricks brick production. So therefore they also used their bricks in the construction of their uh, shelters and they also made huts of circular structures by using perishable materials such as bamboo, wood and reeds. They cultivated mainly dry crops such as wide varieties of millets. They practiced both primary and secondary burials. So therefore, this is some idea about the uh, prehistoric uh, cultures. So now we will look into uh, the stone tools in particular. Uh, Paleolithic culture, which is uh, classified into lower, middle and upper Paleolithic, they have their own uh, typo technology of stone tools, sedition. Mesolithic microblades is uh, other uh, extent of the stone tool production. Now, lower pal when you say lower Paleolithic tools, they are mainly the assemblage mainly consists of pebble tools, which are coal tools, hand axes, which are Acheulean in character, scrapers, and cleavers. In the study of lower Paleolithic in India, the Acheulean technology on which Hand, axe and hand axes and cleavers were made or bulk or represent bulk of the stone tool assemblage. In a, in a very uh, simple sentence, uh, Acheulean hand axes and cleavers uh, makes bulk of the samples for studying the lower Paleolithic uh, culture in India. We can see a transformation from the core tools to flake tools by the time of middle Paleolithic where the hand axe and cleaver had reduced its dimensions and they are called as diminutive, diminutive hand axe and diminutive cleavers. They also started to work on the flakes by the, for the production of borers, burins, scrapers and points, particularly by the use of level bar technology. Upper Paleolithic is mainly represented by flake blade tools where production of blades on cryptocrystalline silica materials of rocks were particularly used. Also, burins, scrapers were also in production. In the sites, from the sites like uh, Chintamanaguri and Vilasodhiyam and other sites in Andhra Pradesh, it uh, shows that the Upper Paleolithic culture were also widely using bone tools, particularly for hafting or the implements such as harpoons. Mesolithic culture represents the microblade technology where microliths for a very very first time the stone tools 
by the time of Mesolithic or the Mesolithic technology represented tiny tools which is which ranges from on an average of one centimeter to three centimeters. So therefore uh, the tiny tools such as uh, blades or bladelets, points, arrowheads, lunettes and various symmetrical tools such as trapezes, triangulars were also uh, made during the Mesolithic culture. So by this what we understand is there is a clear transformation of technology in the production of tools. That is from the core tools to flake tools, flake tools to flake based blade tools and the metrolis themselves. So this transformation is very clear from the lower to middle, middle to upper Paleolithic and the transformation into Mesolithic area. Now let us get into a uh, few sites, few important sites, particularly those sites that are, uh, that are well studied, excavated and dated in the southern part of India, particularly such as from Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Now, uh, if you look at the site of Asirampatta, the site is located on the stream of uh, Kotalayar river near Chennai. The lower Paleolithic Ashulian artifacts of quartzite were found with eroded deposit of shale and sandstone and this, was, and this site was dated by using paleo magnetic measurements and burial dating of artifacts and they dated the lower paleolithic of Asiram Pakkam to 1.5 billion years ago by positioning the Ashulian of South Asia close to African sites uh, dated to 1.7 and 1. million years ago. So the, uh, the studies from Asiram Pakkam pushed the antiquity of Paleolithic culture, the lower Paleolithic culture of Indian subcontinent to 1.5 million years ago and very importantly the dates also shows an enormous trend on the uh, an hominin dispersal into the Indian subcontinent and reaching down to the extreme southern part of the Indian peninsula. So in the site of Asiram Pakkam hand axes and cleavers were very predominantly found on various materials and the bulk of the material was on the quartzite. Athiram Pakkam is a multi-period site. I mean, it also uh, gives a clear uh, indication of the transformation from the lower Paleolithic to middle Paleolithic and uh, recent uh, dates for the Middle Paleolithic was given by Akhilesh Kumar and his team and the Middle Paleolithic at the very same site of Athiram Pakkam it was dated back to 385,000 three, years ago. So at the Middle Paleolithic level diminutive hand axes, diminutive cleavers were found alongside with a marker technology of Middle Paleolithic that is the level one and with points, retouched points as well as bifacially flaked points were also uh, recorded from the middle Paleolithic levels of Atiram Pakkam. Now going to the next site, the Hunski Bajpal Valley which is part of the Shorapur Dao in today's Yadgir district of Karnataka. Here, in the Hunski Bajpal Valley, it is completely an erosional basin of shale, limestone, and low hills of schist and granite. If you look at this topo shed, watershed map of the Hunski Bajpal Valley, in this area, about 200 Ashurian sites were explored by Professor K. Pattaya, and he located their primary context and non-eroded context of the Ashurian sites in this valley. Now the excavations at Izampur 
a site, one of the predominant sites in the, in the Hunski Baichpal Valley, it exposed a quarry and a workshop site. This is a first category of site where there was a similar site is not found elsewhere in the India subcontinent. Because at Izampur, the uh, Ashulian tools and other lower Paleolithic tools were prepared by extracting the limestone locally and it was napped at the site. So therefore, it's a quarry come workshop site. Though the artifacts were largely based on the limestone, other rocks such as dolerite, schist, basalt, shale and turt were also used across the making of stone tools of Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic as well. In addition to the stone tools, wild cattle, horse, elephant and deer fossils were also found. Uh, Izampur was a well dated site prior to the dates or arrival of the dates from Asiram Pakkam and uh, by the use of electron pin re resonance, the Izampur site was dated back to 1.2 million years ago. This is a view of a trench where limestone bedrock is exposed alongside core tools and uh, uh, core tools as well as tools at a different uh, stages of its uh, preparations so uh, if you look at the uh, this limestone slabs the uh, the flex cars as well as the ripples it clearly shows that the slabs locally available limestone bedrock were exploited for the preparation of the core and further process was developed on that. This hand axe from the site of Isampur is very very important. If you, if you follow my cursor, this area is called cortex and on the other side of the hand axe, that is on the venetral side of the hand axe, also similar traces, similar cortex is evident. So what this shows is that a slab, a flat slab was used for working on these stone tools such as hand axes. So it becomes very important that Izampur is both a quarry and workshop site where the tools were particularly worked on the thinner slab. Moving to the another site in uh, Andhra Pradesh is Jwalapuram. Now Jwalapuram is a, also a multi-period site where a sequential contact from the Middle Paleolithic to Iron Age and Early History is evident through uh, microliths and Neolithic culture. Jwalapuram is located in the riverine environs of uh, Jureru River and it is a valley of quartzite and limestone. The valley has volcanic deposit of Angus Toba tuff, which is popularly called as YTT and it occurred during the 74,000 AD. For example, if you look at this section, the, the lower part of the section, which is whitish from this point to the lower, is the deposit of YTT, that is young Toba tuff. Now this YTT is a volcanic deposit which was erupted from the islands of Sumatra and it uh, uh, got deposited in different parts of the Indian subcontinent. Even they, they were, uh, these deposits, volcanic eruptions were also dropped into the Indian Ocean. But what is very important in Jwalapuram is that the volcanic eruption that occurred during the 74,000 years ago where the volcanic deposit before the deposition of volcanic eruption as well as after the deposit of volcanic eruption the middle paleolithic population had occupied this site so therefore there is a continuity of middle paleolithic occupation pre and post volcanic eruption or volcanic deposit now the pre ytt is dated back to 77000 years ago and post-YTT context is 74 
for an air deposit. So therefore, before and after, uh, after eruption and deposition of YTT, medium Paleolithic culture sustained and continued their occupation in the site of Dwalakura. And this site is also known for the occurrence of microliths. Microliths were found in the rock shelter context. This is the, uh, this is the rock shelter of locality 9, where the excavations at the foot of this rock shelter uh, gave a sequence of uh, microliths. Very interestingly, this microlith date back to 35,000 years ago. And it continues down up to 12,000 years ago. Now, our previous understanding of uh, uh, microlithic uh, technology is what was limited to the early Holocene and middle Holocene period. Whereas the microliths in Jalapuram continued right uh, during the late middle Paleolithic and continued down up to uh, Neolithic period and Iron Age as well. Now, very interestingly, uh, along with the uh, microlithic assemblages, human remains, faunal remains, including mollusks, and symbolic artifacts were found alongside with the microblade levels. And majority of the microliths are worked on limestone and also to an extent chert, quartzite, chalcedony, quartz were also used for the microlithic production. All these raw materials such as chert, quartzite, chalcedony, quartz and limestone are locally available in the Dureru Valley of the surroundings of Jalapuram site. So this is the uh, Middle Paleolithic core tools and the core represents of the level war uh, types, microliths, microliths such as both symmetric and asymmetric uh, varieties were also found in this rock shelter alongside scraper and durings were also found. So clearly the microliths irrespective of the type they were probably uh, hafted to uh, hood or the bone material. So the next stage in the development of uh, prehistoric stone tools occurred during the uh, Neolithic period. So uh, before the uh, prior to the Neolithic uh, Neolithic uh, period at the various Neolithic sites of particularly South India, uh, microliths or microblade technology, burings and scrapers and core worked on the crypto-crystalline materials are started to appear and the coming of the Neolithic culture they started to uh, develop uh, two, uh, two varieties of stone tools such as edge to edge stone tools and non-edge stone tools. They were worked on particularly on metamorphic rocks such as polished axe, chisel, edge, discard, wedge, scraper, point and borax. These edge tools were predominantly worked on dolerite, diorite kind of rocks. Whereas the non-edge tools such as pounder, quarrel, pellet, hammer and pestle, they were worked on the schist and the granite, which are locally available. Dolerite, diorite, granite diorite, they are available in the form of dikes in the granitic hills of uh, northern Karnataka and northern Andhra Pradesh. And uh, granite and schist were readily available in the hills themselves. In addition to that, microlithic technology and flake tools continued alongside the uh, uh, alongside the uh, tools such as edge tools and non-edge tools. The Neolithic culture also adopted blade technology such as panel blades, backed blade, and truncated blades. They also uh, use scraper, lunette, owl, triangular and core. So therefore to understand, uh, to better understand if you look at right from the 10,000 BC before common era to 300 before common era the use of crypto crystalline rocks were used for flake tool productions, for blade tool productions. Whereas by 3000 BC the Neolithic culture brought in polished axes, chisels, eggs, very specialized kind of tools for uh, very apt for the agro-pastoral communities or agricultural activities. So that uh, that phase of development here is visible 
from 3000 BCE to 12000 BCE, particularly in southern India. Whereas these technologies of Neolithic culture in the different other region have different chronological time period. to the place. So our understanding is that Neolithic uh, cultures adopted both slate blades as well as the edge, specialized edge tools as well. So therefore subsequent occupation is clearly demonstrated in various Neolithic sites of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. The material profile shows comparatively a greater diversity of raw materials used of both these are shirts where Church and church quartz and chalcedony showing uh, the use of crypto crystalline materials. These are uh, chisel and scrapers of dolerite materials by using the metamorphic rocks. So, this uh, the standardization of the tools as well as the use and varieties of uh, rocks become very clear. Clear, better, uh, much more clear understanding of a massive workshop site of the Neolithic period is evident in the site of Sanganakkalu Kukdal, which is dated to 3200-1200 BCE and this date period represents five different localities or five Neolithic hill settlements in the complex. Now this Sanganakkalu Kukdal site is located. Moving to the another site in uh, Andhra Pradesh is Jwalapuram. Now Jwalapuram is a, also a the workshop activities in Sanganakallu, Kukdal, particularly at the site of Firaguda, was very, very massive production. For example, if you look at the culture on the, on the, on the hill slopes, the deposition of uh, dark rocks here are actually uh, debitage and flakes of dolerite tools. So to a larger extent, the uh, dolerite tools were produced in the workshop context of Sanganakallu, Kukkal and it represents all the phases right from the uh, exploitation of uh, the blank, dolerite blank to the finished and unfinished polished axis by grounding their uh, venetral, dorsal and laterals as well as edge on the granite forming the grooves so clearly visible. So therefore, the Neolithic sites, when you look at the multi-period sites, it dates back from 9000 to 3400 BCE as a pre-Neolithic context and active Neolithic uh, activities in Sanganakalu Kukdal is from 1950 to 1700 BCE and its uh, main Ashmond, uh, Ashmond activities on the hilltop were occurring right from 1850 to 1700 BCE. So 1700 to 11 and 1100 BCE is the post Ashmont formation and this is the time period where the workshop sites in Sanganakalu Kukdal featured its zenith and 1100 BCE and 1200 BCE is the transformation period from Neolithic to, to the place. So our understanding is that Neolithic uh, cultures adopted both slate blades as well as the edge, specialized edge tools as well. So therefore subsequent occupation is clearly demonstrated in various Neolithic sites of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. 
the material profile shows comparatively a greater diversity of raw materials used of both these are church where church and church quartz and chalcedony showing uh, the use of crypto crystalline materials these are uh, chisel and scrapers of dolerite materials by using the metamorphic rocks so this uh, the standardization of the tools as well as the use into the uh, techniques that are adopted techniques are nothing but uh, on what basis on what process a tool was made what was the method used for the napping of the stone tools how the stone tools were uh, crafted represent is rep well is well represented by understanding the techniques that are that were adopted for the stone tool napping or stone tool production Broadly, uh, if you look at the prehistoric stone tool technology and techniques, they can be broadly classified into three types. They are direct percussion, indirect percussion, and grinding and polishing technique. These two, do these two techniques, direct percussion and indirect percussion, they were techniques adopted by different cultural periods in uh, uh, to be put it in a very simple words we cannot try to under, it is very difficult to understand which period which particular cultural period adopted what kind of techniques because stone tool production involved combination or the range or different range of techniques to be adopted that is very much clear during the paleolithic and mesolithic only a distinction of uh, technology comes during the Neolithic period who adopted grinding and polishing technique. However, for flaking and pecking of stone tools, direct percussion or indirect, indirect percussion might also be adopted for making of Neolithic tools such as polished axes. Now going in details, is that what is a direct percussion now direct percussion is a technique where both a soft kind of hammer and hard hammer is used for breaking a stone or breaking a pebble or creating a fracture over the block or the stone directly so in the direct percussion technique, we have about uh, seven types here. Now, uh, the very first one, uh, possibly the very earliest uh, kind of technique is the anvil technique or block on block uh, technique. Now, in this uh, uh, technique, a pebble or a, or a rock or a stone which which was designed to convert into a tool was directly hit on other stone block. So there is a direct uh, contact of uh, two blocks coming together and the stone, the stone which was, which is supposed to be uh, turned into a tool is hit against uh, another uh, block. 
So therefore, it is an anvil uh, technique. Coming to the stone hammer technique, and this is where uh, two blocks were uh, possibly directly handled on two hands, where one pebble or one block, one stone, one block of stone is used as a stone hammer to uh, fracture the other block. So therefore, a stone hammer plays a significant role in uh, in breaking of the other rock or crafting of the other rock. Uh, it is nothing but a napping process. So here, in the uh, stone hammer technique, one block one block of hammer stone is used to, to craft the other block of stone for a desired shape and for a desired size. Cylindrical hammer or hollow hammer technique is where a uh, soft hammer is used. Apart in this case, if you look at here, a, a rock a stone is used as a hammer. So that is why it is called a stone hammer or hard hammer. Whereas in the cylindrical hammer, a hood or an antler or a bone is used to work on the stone tools, particularly working on the lateral edges of a stone block or the stone tools. So cylindrical hammer technique is basically a soft hammer technique by the use of bone, antler or hard wood. The, uh, the fourth one is bipolar technique. In the bipolar technique, it is it is somewhat similar to the combination of anvil technique and stone hammer technique. In the case of bipolar technique, a, a, a block of stone on which the tool has to be made is becomes an intermediary in position where it is followed by at the lower end there is a anvil or a block and by the use of uh, stone hammer followed by placing the uh, cone or the flake on the anvil by the use of hammer uh, hard hammer an impact was made on breaking the uh, material so bipolar technique is an technique where uh, it shows striation marks or impact marks on both sides at the lower side here as well as on the uh, impact uh, end as well. So bipolar techniques is, was innovative uh, technique compared to the other three techniques. Now coming to the Clactonian technique. Now Clactonian technique is again where a combination of uh, flakes were removed. In the case of uh, level of technique, level of technique particularly represents the middle Paleolithic period where they started to work on the flakes. Now level of flakes are a kind of different types of flakes that are uh, detached from a prepared core. So therefore, but the level of technique requires first to have a core prepared for the further processing of napping. Now beginning with the rough trimming, trimming of the sides of the core, as you see in the image, the core is a block or a core is there. Napping is done on the sides, on the laterals. So uh, by the beginning of uh, rough trimming of the sides of the core, this technique also will involve knocking of upper surface. So therefore, uh, flakes in such a manner is removed and the flake scar is usually met in the center. And that is why it is also called as centripetal uh, flakes. Thus obtaining a surface uh, which resembles like a tortoise. And hence it is also called as tortoise cone. Now, Mosterian technique is similar to, it looks like a, a discoidal core or a, or a pebble where the uh, majority part of cortex is removed very systematically and methodologically. So hence the discoidal core uh, is 
where by selecting a large flakes with flat surface on one side as well as removing on the pebbles or nodules with the at least one side side of the flat surface is removed and continuous blows were struck by removing a centripetal flakes and uh, sometimes it alternatively uh, made on the both the faces of the core so therefore the final product of uh, the core looks like a discoidal ball and then it the flakes that were removed as well as the core uh, itself acts as a uh, tool there so it it also it uh, it is nothing but a discoidal core which is uh, very which developed from the uh, middle paleolithic levels now coming to the indirect percussion in the indirect percussion we have three categories one is three, three uh, sub techniques pressure flaking technique fluting technique or blade by percussion and backing and uh, blunting technique now uh, if you look at the uh, pressure technique in the pressure technique the blades or the flakes are removed from a core by using or by putting a pressure uh, it could be by the use of chest or the shoulder or a staff held in both hands to remove the flakes so therefore uh, it's it's a combination of uh, where a pressure is applied on the core to remove the flakes by the use of intermediary tool that is indirect uh, percussion by the use of intermediary tool like this and a blow is given through the soft hammer or the hard hammer so this combination of uh, method makes an indirect percussion by application of punch through an intermediary tool and that uh, intermediary tool has an impact by a pressure or by the punch if you look at uh, this image it is becomes very clear where a core edge or flake by using an intermediary tool as well as the hammer so the the uh, the impact uh, of uh, this technology is that the end result of the core was turned into a fluted core for example if you look at the image here work by working on the pebble or the blank the edges the working on the edges by removing the flake again possibly through a direct or indirect method flakes are removed across the pebble around the pebble or the blank which results in the creation of the fluted uh, fluted core like this the fluted core is nothing but across the core core a long parallel blades are removed a long parallel blades such as like this the blades that are removed out of this what you see the scar it the end product will result in the uh, fluted uh, shape of a core now backing or blunting is uh, another interesting method if you look at the backing technique backing technique is nothing but uh, in order to remove the sharpness on the lateral uh, sides or to blunt the laterals uh, backing or blunting uh, blunting uh, method was used now here uh, the core since the core is generally fluted and the flake that comes out of uh, it is long parallel the uh, on the other side of the lateral edge or the on the and the rare rare portions of the flake blade a natural cortex was possibly uh, retained so therefore the blunting or backing is again uh, developed into two ways for example in the first case if you look at this uh, lateral side there are traces of many flex scars which also includes uh, which is primarily due to the blunting of the edge now this is blunting by intentional napping whereas 
the the uh, the natural cortex on the blade can also act as a uh, backing uh, effect for handling the tool so therefore uh, pressure flaking uh, fluted uh, fluting technique of the blade by percussion backing and blunting they all involve indirect percussion methods primarily now by the time of neolithic period grinding and polishing technique was adopted now uh, for example making of a polished hand uh, polished axe involved four stages of its production or four stages in the process of uh, making an axe flaking pecking grinding polishing what you see from see the images from 1 to 6 is the uh, various stages where a blank is turned into a polished axe for in the case of uh, image 1 and 2 there is a clear distinction this is a natural blank which has a cortex all around and flaking is primary flaking is made to give a rough outline for the axe so uh, the second to third uh, image here shows that the flaking is completed and they are initiating pecking across the uneven surfaces of the dorsal and ventral side of the axe from the image 4 to 5 the axe is now grounded i mean the uh, the uneven uh, for, for removing the further traces of flake scars and the uneven uh, pecking marks the tool is grounded against the bedrock and it is rubbed uh, repeatedly so further prolonged process will result in the uh, production of polished uh, axes like this image the sixth one so flaking pecking grinding and polishing are were four predominant stages in the production of polished tools like neolithic cultural blades so our understanding is that neolithic uh, cultures adopted both flake blades as well as the edge specialized edge tools as well so therefore subsequent occupation is clearly demonstrated in various neolithic sites of karnataka and andhra pradesh the material profile shows comparatively a greater diversity of raw materials used of both these are chert where chert and chert quartz and chalcedony showing uh, the use of crypto crystalline materials these are uh, chisel and scrapers of dolerite materials by using the metamorphic rocks so this uh, the standardization of the tools as well as the use so for the very first time by the ne- in the neolithic period they started to use blocks slabs as well as flakes for the production of uh, edge stone tools so this is uh, both uh, uh, technologically and in terms of chain apparatus it is very different from the earlier stone tool uh, types and technology now we will come to the uh, second part of our uh, talk now how to identify a stone tool features and terminology as i said a stone tools makes a predominant study for the prehistoric cultures one of the uh, pr- one of the prominent uh, one of the 
widely available material to study the uh, prehistoric cultures such as Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic is mainly through the stone tools. So therefore stone tools typology understanding is possible by only only by understanding the features on that. So therefore uh, a thorough understanding of uh, features that are visible on the stone tools and the, the method that we adopt to identify a stone tool is very very important and for that we have to first understand the various terminologies that are used in the uh, stone tool studies and that terminologies will also help us uh, terminology and features uh, will help us to identify the stone tool. Now let us uh, begin with the artifact. Artifact is any object, particularly any man-made object that are artificial product qualifies to be a cultural unit makes an artifact. In simple words, artifact is something should, that should be a man-made man-made object based on the naturally available resources. Secondly, now what are stone tools? Stone tools are fabrication of natural stone that is available in the nature and that naturally available stone or a blank or the pebble is brought to a desired shape and type which is achieved through designated techniques. Designated techniques could be such as direct, tech, uh, direct, indirect, pressure techniques as well. So stone tool is something that are object that are being brought to a desired shape and desired tape by using a designated technique and that tool has some unknown function or use. Now hammer stone, as I told you earlier, hammer stone are of two types. One is hard hammer and soft hammer. Uh, for example, hard hammers could be like pebbles like this on stones. Soft hammers could be hammers like, like on antler or a hood or a bone like this. So these are, uh, this is a very important tool for breaking the stones for making of stone tools. Now what is a core? Core is a piece of stone from which the stone is detached from and it uh, has a traces of striking platform and negative bulb of percussion and conchoidal flex car surfaces like this. If you see here, there is a conchoidal flex car surface, there is a striking platform and there is a complete removal of a large flake of the core. So core is a piece of stone where another piece of stone is removed from the larger stone by using hammer or anvil method where a flake is detached from. Now cortex is where there is traces of original skin or the uh, exfoliation or weathering pattern of the rock is evident. Now, how this cortex emerges? If you take the core tools or the flake tools, depending upon the uh, types and techniques adopted, some part of the tool has the original surface of the natural rock. That is the original skin of the core that makes a cortex. Identifying a cortex is very important for understanding whether it is a core tool or a flake tool as well. And the, the same cortex on some uh, tool types they act as a blunt or a surface for handling the tool. Now, uh, what comes out of during the process of removal of a flake from the core here? And making of stone tools, the, uh, the bits and pieces that comes out of the stone tools, for example, these areas, the flakes that are removed from these uh, surfaces, unlike the cortex, contributes to the 
debitage like this. So therefore debitage is a fractured product that are split in the process of making stone tools. Now flakes, as I told you, the, the piece, of, piece of stone is removed from the core and that piece of stone uh, qualifies to be a flake. But further flaking of a flake to a desired shape will also turn them into the tool. Now how to identify core and flake? Core has negative bulb of percussion and conchoidal flake scar. Whereas the flake has positive bulb of percussion. So therefore, what remains on the core is negative bulb of percussion, whereas what comes on a flake is positive inclination. Now core tools, as I told you earlier, core tools are tools that are worked directly on the uh, naturally available cobble or stone blank or slab. It is not based on the flake. Flake tools are contradictory to the core tools where a, out of a core a piece of flakes that are removed and that based on that flake further which is retouched from the flake detached from the core qualifies to be flake tool. For example, blades, micro blades and loaders. Now flake scars, this plays a very important uh, first hand information to identify a stone tool. How to differentiate between a stone tool and a natural stone that are available in the site or that are available during the exploration. One of the first uh, things that we should do is to identify or spot whether there are flake scars or flake marks. So the flake releases surface as well as depression and shallow cankle traces on the core tool or the flake tool. Therefore, they occur in shaping the tools or retouched on the laterals. The flake scars may appear on the uh, on the facets or on the laterals. So therefore, identifying these marks such as like this are very very important, which is an outcome of removing a flake scar, flake surface, or flake the uh, part of a stone of this by which it was removed. Now, uh, the second, the next to the flake scars, what is important to differentiate between the natural stones as well as stone tools is that identifying a platform, a platform which was prepared, whether it could be a prepared platform or whether it is a naturally, uh, naturally uh, available platform, whereas the surface like this, if you see this surface, the surface like this, where at the, it points out at the end of a flake, where when a, when a blow is given, a flake is removed. For example, this part, which is a removed part. So therefore, the in the, in the case of prepared platform, a faceted platform like this appears, whereas in the case of unfaceted platform, uh, no previous preparations will be evident. But there will always be a, a platform, the, the, the section of a platform either on the core or on the flakes and they are identical. So what, uh, what, what lies below or ben, uh, beyond the platform is the bulb of percussion. For example, uh, here, if you look at the impact mark here, it shows some uh, projection. And that projection is due to a blow or a punch given on this platform here. When a, when a hammer, when a stone hammer or a, a punch is released on this platform as a mechanical force, force, a flake is detached and the immediate surrounding of that punched area reflects the bulb. And that bulb is further diagonal to the traces of striation marks here. For example, you can see percussion waves that got radiated. When a punch was given here on the platform, it, it first created an impact of bulb or percussion. The mechanical waves traveled further into the stone, resulting in the creation of fractured lines like this, fractured lines like this, and radiating, radiating waves. 
So therefore, plat uh, from, right from the plat surface of the platform through the bulb of percussion and striation and ripples, they will help us to identify flake because these uh, these uh, features, uh, bulb of percussion, striation and ripples are commonly are usually found on the uh, detached flakes, not on the core. Now, so far we looked at uh, different uh, tool types and technology. Now we will go to the third part of this talk on how to record the stone tools. Stone tools that you found from the sites or sampled, whether you have done the sampling, whether it's a methodological sampler, sampling or random sampling, there is a certain systematic way of recording the stone tools. So this systematic recording of stone tools are both quantitative and qualitative in nature. They include the very basic uh, record, basic uh, step of uh, recording the stone tools is to differ the stone tools, differentiate the stone tools based on the typology and morphology. What kind of tools uh, they are. Uh, different categories of uh, tool types are segregated from the assemblage and the stone tools are differentiated or segregated based on its morphological features by understanding various features that are there on the core or the plates or the base. The second, sta uh, the second stage is very important where we will try to measure the stone tools. What is the length, width or what is the, uh, uh, what is the weight of the stone tools? So all these uh, morphological approaches of uh, documenting the size, measuring of stone tools uh, plays a predominant role uh, when to analyze the stone, stone tools later. Then physical attributes, that is uh, flakes, cortex and retouch, these kind of attributes and various other attributes are identified on the core tools and different tools. It is nothing but we are trying to identify various features on the tools or the core that are sampled from the sites. Those are, those are called physical attributes. Now, what kind of, to what extent the cutting edge and butt are evident? For example, if there is a hand axe, for example, if there is a cleaver or a Neolithic polished axe, what is, the, what, is the, what is the nature of the cutting edge? What is the extent of the cutting edge? What is the characteristics of the butt along with the cortex and the retouches? These, uh, with the developed technologies, uh, archaeological studies or stone tool studies are also adopting 3D scanning methods to uh, uh, record for quantitative and qualitative analysis of the stone tools. So all this will also contribute to the statistical analysis of the stone tools. Now, in this case, this is uh, this uh, this Im these images shows you how a basic tool measurement can be done. For example, this is a this is a Neolithic axe where the width of the stone tool, the length of the stone tools, as well as the thickness from the lateral side are recorded. These uh, measurements can either be taken in terms of centimeters or millimeters. I personally prefer taking the measurements in terms of millimeters because at the end at the end stages when the assemblages are larger. Millimeters are better uh, segregates for uh, quantitative analysis. So, apart from the uh, length and width and the lateral side, we have to also look into different parts of the tool where the dorsal side and venetral side. Dorsal side is where there are flakes, scars and ridges are evident. Venetral side of the tool is where the it is a face or it is a side from which a core it got detached from. So this is the inner side of the core which it has detached. This is the outer surface of the tool. So this for uh, the side side uh, view of the or the lateral view of the tool is called profile. So basically we can uh, we have to record various features that are there on the dorsal side, venetral side and the profile, the nature of the profile. Longitudinally, the tool can be further uh, 
divided into distal, medial and proximal. Distal side is where usually cutting edge is evident. Proximal side is where the platform or this impact uh, side of the tooth. Medial is where the central part of the tooth. So how, what are the distribution of uh, uh, attributes such as flake scars, uh, ridges, retouches and what are the what is the extent of cortex they are all studied on dorsal and dorsal venetral on the trochoid side now coming to the 3d method uh, as i was mentioned you archaeological studies are also now engaging various uh, high level high end technologies of uh, 3d scanner for example, if you look at uh, this image, this is the scanned image of an hand axe, which clearly shows the uh, shows the contour of the tooth, contour of the tooth, and it also the 3D scanning will record the uh, physical attributes, morphological attributes, and the measurements of the stone tools as well. So therefore, three-dimensional analysis of flake scars is now more feasible by using uh, digital 3D surface scanning technologies or by using three-dimensional measurement tools by using a software such as Microscribe 3DX. If uh, a scanner cannot be adopted to a uh, study of the stone tools, we can also limit our uh, documentation of the stone tools to the basic of foot drawing. This is a classical method of uh, recording and documentation of the stone tools apart from uh, quantitative uh, measurements of the stone tools. I will give a brief uh, explanation of uh, how to draw a stone tool. In a simple method, it can be adopted by trace drawing of stone tools. It's a very basic one. Uh, on the graph sheet, place the tool. First, you mark the outline of the stone tool such as the image A then once this image is created once the outline is drawn uh, mark the surface of or the outline of flake scars such as if you see on the uh, cutting edge here the flake scar is uh, marked the extent of this flake scars here then once this flake scars extent are marked on the outline profile of the drawing, then they can be uh, combined by looking at the extent and distribution of flake scars. For this, a compass can also be used to measure what is the length and width of the flake scars. For example, this flake scars, probably the secondary one, is ranges from this end to this end. This, uh, these two ends can be measured and it can be further uh, drawn. So ultimately uh, by, by following a trace method of drawing stone tools to a certain extent the stone tools can be recorded for morphological features such as flake scars, cortex or any other retouches that has occurred. Remember for each, uh, for each category of features the symbols that you give are the the shading the shade that you give on the uh, drawing of the stone tool also differs for for example if you want to if you want to show the presence and position of this trekking platform these kind of symbols can be used if you want to show the position of uh, bulbar scars or percussion uh, percussion uh, uh, presence these kind of symbols can be used blank uh, outline triangular or circular uh, to show the extent of striking platform from which end to which end is the striking platform you can show this kind of uh, uh, arrows cortex can be uh, shown in the shaded uh, dots like this the thermal surface can be shown in the uh, form of contour lines so like this for uh, gloss edge, edge smoothing surface, bracket to emphasize edge detail, serration marks, striking platform marks, for all these uh, features, different shading symbols can be used for 
showing the stone tools as accurately as possible like this. For example, you are showing the dorsal side of this tool, the lateral side of the tool. And you can also show the profile or the lateral side of this stone tool in the case of like this. Uh, if you look at, this is the image of hand axe. This is, this could, uh, do, this could be possibly dorsal and unetral and the central one is showing the profile of the stone tools. So, uh, this kind of drawings can be developed by basic method and by adopting very importantly these symbols in use to signify or to show the shapes or the features on the Now, quantitative, uh, in the quantitative method, you have already uh, measured the stone tools, length, width, uh, uh, cutting edge, uh, extent, uh, various other uh, quantitative uh, attributes are measured. Now, once it is pulled, those uh, attributes, that those quantified data can be further taken up for the statistical analysis of the stone tool. Now, the, now, here also I am telling you a basic method where the mean, median, mode of the stone tool quantitative attributes can be understood. For example, what is the, uh, for example, you have 100 stone tools study. You have studied 100 stone tools. Now, how to quantify that? So, what is the length of these stone tools to, uh, that can be calculated further by using of mean formula? What could be the average length of the stone tool? What could be the middle number of the uh, stone tool size out of 100? What could be the recurrent uh, uh, occurrence of the stone tools? For example, if there are 100 stone tools, uh, uh, maybe 10 to 20 stone tools have similar dimensions. So what is the more value of that? In order to, if you want to go for the higher level of uh, analysis, statistical analysis, with a particular purpose to understand the distribution of stone tool types and technology from different localities or from the different sites, you can also adopt chi-square te test. Now, there are two types of chi-square tests uh, that can be suitable for the stone tool studies. One is a chi-square uh, goodness of fit test which determines uh, sample data whether it matches to the actual population. You have an hypothesis and to test that hypothesis whether it matches to the population data that you have, a chi-square goodness test can be used. Another method is that a chi-square test for independence compare for two variables can also be used. For example, if you want to compare two different tool types within a site, if you want to compare the same two uh, tool types of different sites what are what is the difference or to what extent they differ quantitatively morphologically etc they can also be understood from the chi-square test and again as i said this kind of statistical analysis depends on what you want to uh, find out out of the tools for higher level of analytical works now this chi-square test can be uh, you uh, can be uh, done on the spss software as well as the Excel software. SPSS would be the higher version. So all this will tell us the what is the relationship of uh, uh, from one tool to the other tools in terms of quantity and uh, quality works. Coming to the attributes, uh, attributes can be uh, broadly into number of uh, features. For example, in this uh, in this uh, distributive chart, I have shown uh, what for, ex this, uh, for example, this is these kind of attributes are suitable for the bifaces, hand axe, cleavers and polished axe. Now, uh, the first one is serial number, site name, from which site you have brought the material or stone tools. Then you are trying to identify the in what uh, stage of production the stone tool is uh, uh, formed. Then whether it is an axe based uh, in terms of polished axes. What is the shape of the axe? What is the form of the axe? Whether it's triangular, lenticular, ovoid, elongated, or spanned. What is the horizontal cross section of the axe? Whether it is flat, ovoid, or lenticular. What is the length of the tool? What is the edge, cutting edge width of the tool? What is the width medium? What is the width butt of the uh, tool? What is the butt? Uh, I mean, what is the width of the butt part of the tool? What is the uh, extent of medial part of the tool. What is the thickness of the tool? What is the size 
or the surface of the surface area of the platform on the tool what is the platform type whether it is natural or uh, altered or it is plane or cortical what is the cortex percentage in the in the case of cortex percentage we have to do some basic uh, calculation to turn the uh, surface area of the cortex into the percentage what is the cortex form whether it is subrounded or angular polished uh, to what extent the axis is polished whether on the proximal side distal side there or edge end or margin or butt end or the axis is polished throughout its uh, surface whether the polished uh, uh, whether the ventral area is polished whether the marginal or polished whether the butt end is polished or non polished or the butt end is broken or damaged or the butt end is intact or not what is the cortex form so all this various attributes will tell us uh, will give us a detailed uh, data of a tool now when it comes to attributes of core and microblade particularly microliths we can try to understand in the case of core whether it's a bipolar core or a single platform core or multiple platform based core and what is the material whether it's a chert quartz chalcedony chert or any other material what is the length width thickness of the tool whether it has a single thickness of the core whether it has a single platform double platform so like this various attributes can be developed including cortex bladelet scar count on the core so these features can also be uh, uh, adopted to the blades and bladelets analysis so predominantly the length width thickness of the blade what is the proximal width medial width and distal width what is the platform width of the uh, platform that is found on the tool cortex percentage how many scars are there how many fake scars are there on the tool that is the dorsal count whether the tool is intact or broken so in this and so therefore all these attributes are very very important for understanding the stone tools for better understanding of the prehistoric culture in indian subcontinent now let us come to the last part of our talk to conclude stone age archaeology is more about the stone tools because because of the highly non perishable nature of the stone tools who used rocks or the stones they play a significant role in locating the prehistoric sites such as paleolithic mesolithic and neolithic but what is very important here is to understand the tool typology technique methods and systematic way of recording and analysis for the better understanding of the culture so therefore this transition can be better understood from the pebble tools to core tools core tools to flake tools flake tools to blade tools blade tools to micro blades which spans over different cultural uh, periods and sub periods such as lower paleolithic middle paleolithic upper paleolithic mesolithic and neolithic so it's all about the stone tools on identifying recording and analyzing uh, in a very systematic way so therefore the combination of techniques were probably used for all this uh, preparation of stone tools and thereby have better uh, finishing of the tools was possible by adopting a combination of techniques and probably the tools as well as, well as the cores were later rejuvenated and reused uh, after the discarded ones so these tools not only show us improved efficiency in their activities but also infer on its function from hand driven tools to acting as harpoons and axes so keeping all this in mind at the end of the day we should also try to understand the chain operator of stone tools a chain operator of stone tools is trying to uh, study in detail face wise from the right from the procurement of raw materials from the natural formations to the end process of finishing and using of the stone tools this 
a long this elaborate process of different stages of chain operator should be understood very thoroughly for analyzing the spatial distribution of stone tool types among the regions or within the regions and among the sites thank you